So is it possible we can detect anomalies in, in space time? Well, you, you could detect, and there's, there's been some work on this, like with the Akubre drive, you know, these the proposals for warp drives. And we can talk about that later. I'm, I'm skeptical of those, but because um, it may really be possible you just can't go faster than the speed of light. But people have done work on like, you know, what would be the s- signature of uh, an Akubre drive? What would be the signature? Like, you know, could you detect if you're using a drive like that, then you certainly are distorting space time, which means any light that's passing by has gotten, mm-hmm. you know, the, it's, it's, its trajectory has gotten altered because it had to pass through the distorted space time. So yeah, there are possibilities along with that. You know, one of the funny things, I don't know if they've gotten past this, but somebody calculated the problem with the Akubre drive or this warp drive was that if, if you dropped out of warp, there would be this spray of gamma rays that would like sterilize any planet in front of you. Mm-hmm. So it's like, well, yeah. Yeah, you probably don't want to do that, but that would be a great bio or techno signature. <laughs> Another planet obliterated. So you think it's not possible to travel fast than speak I, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. But what I think, you know, if you look at the physics we understand, right? Yeah. Um, the, you know, every possibility for faster than light travel really relies on something that doesn't exist, right? So, so you know, the cool thing is Einstein's field equations, you can actually play with them. The equations are right there. You can add things to the, you know, right or left-hand side that allow you to get something like the Akubre drive. That was a metric that, uh, you know, showed you like, oh, it's a warped bubble. It's a warping of space-time that moves through space-time faster than the speed of light, right? Mm-hmm. Because nothing can move across space-time faster than the speed of light, but space-time itself can move faster than the speed of light. But here's the problem with all of those proposals is they all need something. The thing you added, the little fictional term you added on the into the equations is something called um, exotic matter, and it doesn't exist. It's really just something we dreamed up to make the equations do what we wanted them to do. So, you know, it's a nice fiction, but really right now, you know. You know, we live in this weird moment in history of the great acceleration where like uh, the technology we use now is, you know, is completely different from the technology we used 10 years ago is remarkably different from the technology from a hundred years ago. Um, but you know, I remember playing, um, uh, Assassin's Creed where everybody's like, you know, what is it? It's 1200 and everybody's like stab, stab, mm-hmm. stab. And I was like, yeah, it's a great game. And then I got Assassin's Creed two and, uh, it was 300 years later and everybody's like stab, stab, stab. And it was like 300 years and the technology hadn't changed. And that was actually true for most of human history, right? You used your great grandfather's tools because there was no need to have any other new tools. And you probably did his job. Uh, So, you know, we can be fooled into thinking like, oh, you know, technology is going to go on forever. We're always going to find new advances as opposed to sometimes things just flatten out for a long time. So you have to be careful about that bias that we have living in this time of great acceleration. Yeah, but uh, also it is a great acceleration and we also are not good at predicting what that entails if it does keep accelerating. So for example, somebody like um, Eric Weinstein often talks about we underinvest in theoretical physics research. Basically like we're trying too hard for traditional chemical propulsion on rockets versus like trying to hack physics sort of warp drives and so on because it's really hard to do space travel and it seems like in the long arc of human history if we survive the way to really travel across long distances is going to be some new totally new thing right right so it's not going to be an engineering problem it's going to be a physics a fundamental physics fundamental physics problem yeah i mean i agree with that in principle, but I think there's been, you know, I mean, there's a lot of ideas out there. People, you know, string theory, people have been playing with string theory now for 40 years. It's not like people haven't been, it's not like there hasn't been a lot of effort. And, you know, and again, I'm not going to predict, I, I think it's entirely possible that we have, you know, there's you know, incredible boundaries of physics that have yet to be uh, poked through, in which case then all bets are off, right? Once you get sort of, you know, interstellar, fast interstellar travel, whoa, you know, who knows what can happen. Um, but I, I, I tend to be drawn to like science fiction stories that take the speed of light seriously. Like what kind of civilization can you build where like it takes, you know, 50 years to get to where you're going mm-hmm. and a 50 years back. Like, so I don't know. I mean, yeah, there's no way I'm going to say that, that we won't get warp drives, but as of right now, 
there's, it's all fictional. It's, you know, it's barely even a coherent concept. Well, it's also a really exciting possibility of hacking this whole thing by extending human lifespan or extending our notion of, uh, of time and maybe as dark as to say, but the value of an individual human life versus the value of life from the perspective of generations. Yeah. So you can have something like a generational ship that travels for hundreds of thousands of years yeah. and it you're not sad uh, that you'll never see the destination because you kind of have the value for yeah. the uh, prolonged yeah. survival of humanity versus your own individual life. Yeah. It's a wild ethical question, isn't it? One of the, that book I told you about, Aurora, <laughs> was such, I love the book because it was such a sort of inversion of the usual. Because, you know, I've read, I love science fiction. I've read so many generation ship stories. And they get to that planet. The planet turns out to be uninhabitable. It's inhabited, but it's uninhabitable for Earth. Because, again, he has this idea of, like, you know, life is particular to their planets. So they turn around and they come back. And then when they land, the main character goes, for, there's still people who are, you know, arguing for more generation ships. And she goes and she punches the guy out. Because she spent her whole life in a tube, you know, with this. I, th I thought that was a really interesting inversion you know the interesting thing about about we were talking about these space habitats yeah. but if you really had a space habit not some super cramped you know crappy the usual version of a century ship but if you had these like space habitats that were really you know like the o'neill cylinders they're actually pretty nice places to live put a thruster on those you know like why why keep them in the solar system maybe that's maybe space is full of like these sort of traveling space habitats mm -hmm. that are in some sense a you know they're worlds in them in and of themselves there's the show Silo, which raises the question of basically, if you're putting on a generational ship, uh, what do you tell the inhabitants of that ship? You might want to lie to them. Yeah. You might want to tell them a story right. that they believe. Right. Because there is a society, there's human nature, there's like, how do you maintain a homeostasis of that little society? Um, I mean, that, that's a fascinating technical yeah. question, the social question, the psychology question. You know, the generation ship too, and you know, which I talked about in the book, the idea of the, also the, you know, you talked about extending human lifetimes or, um, you know, the stasis, the cryostasis, which is a mainstay yeah. of science fiction, you know, that, you yeah, know, right. You can be put to, you, know, you can basically put in suspended animation and such. None of these things we know are possible, but you know, it's so interesting. And this is why I love science fiction, the way it seeds ideas, right? All these ideas we're going to talk about because they've been staples of science fiction for 50 years. I mean, the whole field of cryogenics. Yeah. Where are we at with that? Yeah, I wonder what the state of the art is for a complex organism. Can how you long, freeze? Right. How long can you freeze and then unfreeze? Right. Maybe, maybe like with bacteria, you could do freeze. Oh, bacteria can last. This is the thing about panspermia, right? Pax how long can uh, you know? How long can a uh, bacteria survive in a rock that's been blasted? You know, if there's a comet impact across uh, you know interstellar distances, that does seem to actually be possible. People have done those kind of calculations. It's not out of the realm of possibility. But a complex organism, multicellular, multi-systemic or multi-systems, right, with organs and such. Also, what makes an organism? I mean, it could, you know, which part do you want to preserve? Because maybe the for humans, it seems like, uh, like what makes a personality? It feels like you want to preserve a set of memories. Like if I woke up in a different body with the same memories, I pretty much, I would feel like I would be the same person. Altered Carbon? Have you, that's a, that's a great series. I think it's on Netflix. It's, 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 you know, that's a really great series where that's exactly the idea of sleeves. Everybody's able to like, you know, you can re-sleeve in another body. Um, and it <laughs> raises exactly sort of this question. It's not the greatest cyberpunk, but it's pretty good. It's got, it's got some great, great action sequences too. As we get better and better advancements in uh, large language models that are able to be fine-tuned on you, it's, it raises a question because I, to, to me, they've already passed the Turing test as we traditionally have defined it. So if there's going to be an LLM that's able to copy you in terms of language extremely well, it's gonna raise ethical and, uh, I don't know, philosophical questions about what makes you, you. Like what, if, if there's a thing that can talk exactly like you, like what is the thing that makes you, you? Is it, it, is it it's, it's gonna speak about your memories very effectively. This leads us to if we're going to get to the the blind spot. I, I, you know, I'm of the opinion, heretical in some camps, that you know the brain is not the minimal, the minimal structure for consciousness. 
You know, it's the whole body. It's embodied in me, actually, in some sense. It's communities, actually. Um, so, yeah, so I don't, I mean, I'm, you know, I could be wrong, but this is, you know, this is what this whole work that I did with Marcelo Gleiser and Evan Thompson, the um, philosophy of science, which is interesting because it leads to this question about, you know, right, oh, maybe we should just download ourselves into computers, right? That's another story that that one tells. I'm super skeptical about those, but is that's one of the narratives about interstellar travel is just like, and that anybody we meet, is it going to be a machine anyway? Whether it's like whether it's downloaded bodies or it's just going to be artificial intelligence. Like there's the whole idea of how long does biological evolution last? Maybe it's a very short period before everybody go, you know goes to or the machines take over and you know kill you or you know it's some hybrid 